All right, guys, can you hear me? So I'm going to pull up the, um, um, let's see, let me get the screen pulled up here. Yeah, here we go. And I've got a weird, hold on one second, let's, let's see, if I've got, all right. All right, hopefully, let me get to the slide we were talking on. We were talking specifically about um, benzodiazepines and treatment of uh, GAD. And I think here we are, okay. All right, so this should be, can everybody see the slide? I hope so. And yes, let me sir. get, great. And let me get you guys so I can get the chats going so that I can see when you guys say something and didn't think that y'all were quiet like you were yesterday, okay. All right, guys, so we're gonna pick back up and, um, um, the um yes okay so we're going to pick up here um and i moved the um move the mic closer joy so maybe that'll be um much better so just let me know okay this is uh, uh the next uh, slide going here is sort of an interesting thing because i've actually um actually got involved with a murder trial dealing with this um, one of the things is that I don't know, have any of you experienced uh, patients that have had benzodiazepine induced disinhibition? Um, just out of curiosity. Okay. So the situation is, is that uh, a lot of people, when they think about benzodiazepines, um, is they, they think about that it being, it's going to be a depressant. And, um, but there are instances in which individuals, when they have been given a, benzodi a benzodiazepine, actually get more excited. And um, so, Maribel, you've seen it with teens. So, um, rage outbursts and aggression and things like that. Now, a lot of people, when they see this, one of the things that they think is that uh, the issue is that it's, um, that they just haven't given enough benzodiazepines. So one of the things that they would, um, that people do is, well, you know, this should be calming them down. They're getting more excited. Obviously I haven't given enough. And so they will sometimes give more benzodiazepines. The, um, the thing that, the case that I had was basically, um, it was a domestic dispute. And um, what we did see was that the, um, um, the, the guy basically would, um, um, he was not prescribed benzodiazepines, but was taking Xanax. And basically, uh, when he would take it, his um, um, girlfriend would say that um, he was uh, he would start getting just crazy when he would go on um, on Xanax. So um, what happened is apparently, you know, this is what occurred. And then, unfortunately, from a standpoint, was uh, she stated she shot him uh, in self defense. But apparently there was like two phones on which uh, videoed and um, it was like, yes, she did shoot him the first time, which was in a non-lethal place. But um, her other issues came into play where that she basically, I mean, shot him like seven or eight times and all this was on video. So, um, but it was the question that I was asked is that can benzodiazepines produce these um, um, you know, aggression and rage and things like that. And the answer was yes, it is not real common, in, uh, but it does occur. And it's been reported with a number of uh, uh, benzos, um, diazepam, alprazolam, clonazepam, all three of those, and probably will occur or would occur with the other benzodiazepams. Um, some people have argued that um, uh, it probably uh, is probably less likely. Uh, with the lower uh, potency agencies, uh, what's been suggested is potentially using oxazepam. Um, it's a lower potency, has a slower absorption, and so you may not get it. 
but the reality of it is, is it seems to be potentially uh, could occur with any of the benzodiazepines. Um, so it's something you just need to be aware of uh, because again, one of the issues that happens is when this occurs, sometimes clinicians are not aware of this. And so as a result of that, what these clinicians will do is that they will um, basically just give more of the benzodiazepine. Um, the, what we do see is that when it does occur, that the patients are sort of some common denominators here. It's usually people that have personality disorders or have had some history of discontrol. And um, probably you don't, well, you don't want to give more benzodiazepines to this gave if this occurs, but a lot of times an antipsychotic can be used to reverse this effect. Um, the, again, the biggest thing I've seen over the years is that the recognition that this can occur, talking to some people that have had some experience with this and um, just recognizing that it may be due to the benzodiazepine and that by giving more benzodiazepines is not the best thing. Sometimes by just not stopping, by just stopping the benzodiazepine and then hopefully if you're using a short acting drug is basically it can wear off. But if necessary, this can be used to, to um, uh, or can be treated with the presence of an antipsychotic. We also see that, the, and this next state is something that individuals um, typically will see uh, from a standpoint of, um, we see this reported a little bit more frequently, and that's benzodiazepine-induced depression. Um, the, and, and people can sort of understand this because they think of um, benzos as being a CNS depressant. So what we see is that sometimes that um, a person that may be depressed, the benzodiazepines may actually worsen the depression or result in the emergence of depression. So typically when this occurs, uh, one of the issues um, is you can treat it with an antidepressant, but one of the things that you would probably think about is if you recognize that it was probably the benzodiazepine that's producing it, then the issue may be just simply go to an antidepressant that's used for treatment of depression as well as for, um, um, for anxiety. So that's an issue. Now, one of the big things um, when we're dealing with, you know, uh, mental illness one time uh, in some instances is the issue of overdose. Um, this is um, one of the issues that we're concerned about is that a lot of people will um, develop a tolerance and then they will take the benzodiazepines or that they will mix the benzodiazepine with some other um, agent. Um, most people, and this is what I said earlier before lunch, most individuals, the issue is, is that the benzodiazepines uh, are considered relatively safe and definitely are considered significantly more safe than, say, the barbiturates that we used to use. The biggest problem we run into is when they are combined with other CNS depressants, okay? This is a key point, and it is not a contraindication, but one of the things we see is that we have had a lot of deaths with people that have been taking uh, narcotics, opiates in particular, and combine them with, um, with a benzodiazepine. Um, I see lawyers all the time are going, they wanna say, well, you know, these should never, to be, never should be combined. Um, there's times when there may be a necessity to combine these. Um, and um, the point is, is that there is danger, so you need to be careful. Your concern would be is if you had, for example, a chronic pain patient or a person that was abusing drugs, that would be, you know, that you may be prescribing to, to them as a benzodiazepine. So the benzodiazepines can, you know, we find that people can overdose with benzos by themselves. And we've had some instances with that. Um, at a high enough dose, they will produce significant CNS depression and could even produce death, even with respiratory depression. But typically when we see overdose with the benzodiazepines, the signs and symptoms of them usually is just uh, pretty much very sedated and very somnolent. Uh, we always wanna be careful about respiratory depression. So what we have to be careful about is we wanna be aware of that. One of the concerns, if you have somebody that may potentially be thinking about doing that, you may wanna prescribe at a lower uh, amount or for a shorter period of time. 
Um, there is an agent that can reverse the, um, the uh, CNS depression produced by, um, be, by um, benzodiazepines, that is flumazenil. Um, the flumazenil will not reverse the respiratory depression. So uh, it's not like Narcan in the sense that the Narcan uh, or naloxone reverses the opiate, all the aspects of the opiate. The flum uh, flumazenil will reverse the, the sedation and so forth, but it will not necessarily reverse the um, respiratory depression. So we have to be aware of that. There's a number of interactions. We've touched on a few of these, and this is something you need to be aware of. Remember we talked about early on the antacids. Your biggest concern there is they're going to decrease absorption. So my concern typically with antacids is going to be that if someone is, um, you know, taking a benzodiazepine, a lot of times people may be in a very um, anxious um, situation or anticipating anxiety, so they take their benzodiazepine. And one of the signs or of stress and so forth can sometimes be some gastric, um, you know, um, irritation or some uh, indigestion. So they may pop a, you know, a um, uh, an antacid. So my concern is, is someone is, you know, takes their benzodiazepine with an antacid, and then it doesn't seem to be working, and they may, you know, take take them a little bit more frequently. But the main thing is usually a decrease in efficacy. Okay. Or the other thing is, is somebody's taking it with antacid, so they independently increase their dosage, so that the next time they or they may take some where they're not taking an antacid, and they've upped the dosage, and basically, you know, they get some, some side effects there. Um, Got to be careful about any CNS depression, uh, antihistamines. Uh, probably the ones we worry about the most. Uh, definitely the one we worry about uh, with regard to excessive CNS depression is going to be alcohol. Uh, combining the uh, benzodiazepines with alcohol is a big concern. Um, the other one, which actually I don't have listed on here, is narcotics. Um, but in general, any CNS depressant, antihistamines, even the ones that are considered um, like chlorpheniramine is a uh, considered a non-sedating antihistamine. It can still produce sedation. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, um, that can sometimes produce CNS depression. So these can be, um, this can be issues that, that come into play. Uh, with regard to metabolism, the one I worry about probably the most is right here, cimetidine. That's the over-the-counter acid reducer. And um, what it can do is that some of the drugs that, are, that go through cytochrome P450, um, what we find is that that can, and uh, potentially these are the long-acting drugs, is basically you can get a, a big accumulation of these and so it's one of the drugs that we definitely want to worry about uh, or be concerned about because, again, it's available over the counter. By the way, I don't know if you guys saw it, but there's the FDA sent out a note that Zantac um, has a contamination with one of the carcinogenic issues on it. I know that uh, the oncologist that uh, has treated my wife, she is, they use a lot of, um, of uh, these um, um, acid reducing agents and uh, she is telling her patients not to take them anymore. Um, erythromycin, fairly common antibiotic uh, that can be prescribed. Um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can come into play. Typically, if we do have these other drugs already on board, we may want to think about using um, lorazepam, oxazepam, or temazepam. Uh, those um, will don't go through the cytochrome P450 pattern as much. Um, the other thing is that um, um, with anticonvulsants, one drug you might prescribe is Tegretol, carbamazepine, but this may also be for any anticonvulsant is they tend to be inducers. So what happens is they may uh, decrease the benzodiazepines. Um, so therefore you may end up with, a, um, with lower efficacy. So the concern here would be is you have a patient that starts having a reemergence of symptoms. Um, and the reason that may be occurring is because they, you're not, you're basically decreasing the amount of benzodiazepine that's there. Okay. So let's move from the benzodiazepine to look at a couple of other agents that have been used uh, for treatment of general anxiety disorder. 
One is buspar, um, buspirone. Um, this one has been, um, serves as an alternative to either antidepressants or the benzodiazepines. We do know it is a partial serotonin agonist, and it has a little bit of an affinity, a very slight affinity for the dopamine 2 receptors. Um, this drug comes into play. I'm just curious, do any of you have patients uh, that you've seen that are on Buspar? Uh, what is your general feeling? Is it you think the patients are doing well on it? Do you like it uh, with your patients? Any concerns with it? So Janelle, you said it works well there. Um, Joy, you've gotten some good good reviews. Good. Okay. Um, so there, Janelle, you've got polypharmacy. Tell me about that a little bit. So make sure. And Maribel, I was going to come to that in just a minute. So the idea is that sometimes um, the individuals um, that are at a risk for benzodiazepines, um, the um, the issue becomes that um, to move to not use a benzodiazepine, and Buspar was one that has been was really promoted somewhat for doing that. Um, and then, so let me address the. Um, the snorting first, then I'm going to come back to Janelle's comment there. So the idea was this was, as far as it working, uh, it seemed to work pretty good. Um, but we do see some patients have learned that if they snort it, that it can give them some euphoria. Um, and, um, but, you know, it was really pr promoted somewhat for an alternative to benzos. Uh, the other thing, though, that happened gets back to um, Janelle's comment is a lot of times I've seen Buspar, which just sort of gets added on. Um, they put them on usually an SSRI and um, uh, maybe an, SR, uh, an SNRI, and then that's not quite working, and so they add Buspar. I've had a few clinicians around here that are a little, they don't like the patients on Buspar. It says it sort of creates some, creates some um, issues on them. Um, the fogginess is one thing, uh, Chiara, that you mentioned is, is, is one of the common complaints. Um, so, and I've had some people that uh, uh, for some reason they've heard a lot of bad things about Buspar and so they sort of freak out a little bit when they hear their, you know, their, um, especially when they're gonna go on it. Um, the, um, it's not in for general anxiety disorder with comorbid depression. Um, typically what you're going to do is you're going to use a monotherapy, but as Janelle said, what happens is this sort of gets thrown into the mix um, to sort of hopefully take care of it. Um, it is approved. Um, it doesn't work on the GABA-A receptor, so therefore it's not going through the same pathway as the benzodiazepine. And there's no cross-reactivity with the benzos or the barbiturates, so you don't see that aspect. But one of the things um, that is um, that people say they like about it is it doesn't appear to be sedative um, and it doesn't produce this uh, muscle relaxation which sometimes people can say with benzodiazepines they just feel fatigued and just like they have no energy um, one of the things is it was a, a big push was for people that again was uh, going to be put on uh, that had a concern with addiction but um, so it says it has no abuse potential, but we do see people that are sort of snorting it um, and say it gives them a little bit of a buzz. But um, uh, that was a concern because, again, it was designed for um, for this. I've seen people snort effects or I don't know if you guys have seen that, but, but we do see it. But again, this one is usually they like to use it when somebody may be at a potential for abuse with the especially with the benzodiazepine. Um, the mechanism appears to be because it acts on serotonin 1A receptors that are, it's a partial agonist there. These are autoreceptors, so they, they affect on um, the serotonin release. So basically what they do is they reduce serotonin release in some, um, in some areas. Uh, one of the downsides um, is that there is a latency of therapeutic effect. And I'm just curious, um, those of you that have patients on there, uh, did y'all, do you know what you have um, as far as the latency period? If, if your patients that you were treating, uh, what degree of latency they had with regard to this, with the buspirone?
So about two weeks, right? So typically what they're going to say is they say several days. Um, um, most people are, are put it at about 10 to 14 days is what uh, they're going to say. So it's important when you're treating this is that the individuals understand that there is going to be, that's not going to act really quick. Okay. Um, sometimes with the anxiety, people will think about a benzodiazepine or something where you may see some effects fairly quickly. So one of the things is, um, well, there's two things is one is to make sure that the issue is that the recognition, there may be a delay, but the other thing you want to be careful about, and I see this sometimes with general practitioners is a day or two afterwards. Um, it is, um, it is a situation where that they may want to up the dose. So Maribel, there's some of the depressive symptoms that may occur may be associated with the serotonin release, uh, the decreased serotonin release. Um, it's one of those things I was looking at the, um, um, at, um, with regard to, um, the adverse reactions with it. Um, one of the things is they list serotonin syndrome. Um, the, um, but that's actually a list, but they do uh, list some issues with depression and even list some of the issues associated with things like um, extrapyramidal symptoms. And so this is probably associated with an interaction with the dopaminergic system. Typically what you see with a lot of these individuals, a lot of people will complain of impaired concentration, this fogginess as uh, was mentioned by Jara. Um, but um, um, some dizziness or drowsiness is, is another thing that may occur. There is actually an active metabolite, which is one phenylpiperazine. And what it does is it stimulates the alpha-2 receptors and which um, may actually um, increase the locus ceruleus firing. And some people have suggested that may account for some of its actions. It does go through, a, one of the reasons there's a delay in response is it does go through uh, first pass metabolism. Um, it's also metabolized by cytochrome 3A4. And one of the things you have to be careful about with this drug is because anything that goes through 3A4 may be subject to um, interaction with grapefruit juice. So grapefruit juice, somebody is taking this can sometimes inhibit that enzyme and the buspirone levels can elevate. So again, just like Anything that's an inhibitor of 3A4, get back to cimetidine, um, you know, is another one can uh, create uh, problems. So we have to be careful about that. The, um, some of the studies have actually said this is as equally um, efficacious as a benzodiazepine. That's been one of the big pluses for people that are using this quite a bit. Um, here's the other problem with it. Um, it, it, it really comes down to this. It's gotta be taken daily takes about a week to two weeks to get an effect, but you're almost like an antidepressant. It may take four to six weeks for maximal effects. So one of the things that we have to be careful about is just again, um, trying to increase the dosage um, too quickly. And um, that's, and there has even been some people discussed to try to increase the dose or try to increase the onset is to use an inhibitor of cytochrome P450, that we don't recommend because one of the things that's gonna happen is you have a tendency to um, get to toxic levels or to have significant side effects. And so that's one of the things that you wanna be careful about. So one of the things needs to be is, you know, patient needs to understand that it may take a little while for it to kick in. Um, if, some, if you're in an emergency, obviously this is not gonna be a drug you wanna use. Um, this one um, doesn't prevent, for, so for example, if you had somebody on a benzodiazepine, this one is not going to prevent withdrawal. So what you still have to do is you have to taper the benzodiazepine um, if you're switching to buspirone. You don't want to stop the benzodiazepine, especially someone who's been on it for a while, and immediately put them on buspirone because they'll go through benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, the sedation, um, there's not there, there's a few patients that may show some sedation, but typically the patient is going to be extremely restless. You're going to have more restlessness. And one of the big things that people like about buspirone is they pretty much say it doesn't really impair psychomotor performance, but we do see, like was mentioned earlier, sometimes these individuals say that I feel like I'm sort of in a fog. So it is a concern with regard to, we just, you know, have to be aware of this. Typically, 
the um, um, side effects, you know, dizziness is probably one of the most common things. Um, some restlessness, as I mentioned, there sometimes there's some GI distress, uh, you know, diarrhea, constipation, sometimes primary di diarrhea. Um, may have difficulty sleeping, uh, may have some periods of insomnia when we first start it. And um, uh, again, typically drowsiness is not too bad. We tend to see more restlessness. And um, so that's an issue um, uh, that's there. Um, the, uh, as, you, as you put Maribel, foggy but restless doesn't really sound good. But again, this is minimal and maybe much better than what you would be dealing with with the benzodiazepine, especially with somebody with a substance abuse problem. Um, we've had some reports that people have not benefited as much, but one of the things that's come back with criticism of those reports is one is that um, the people may not have may have been starting with too low a dosages and maybe had not received an adequate dosage before they discontinued it. So one of the things is that um, they've not been on treatment long enough and so they gave it and uh, before it could really work, they said it's not working, let's drop it. Um, the other thing is sometimes, and, and we see this for all drugs, is sometimes people have very inappropriate expectations of the drugs. Um, it's gonna fix everything quickly. And again, the time it takes to fix it and so forth, those are things that could definitely be um, major concerns with regard to, um, um, you know, the patient not accepting it. Or not even not only the patient accepting it, but maybe even the clinician that's accepting it. Okay. All right, so let's see, that finished the buspirone, and we're gonna talk about the use of anticonvulsants, but let's, Go ahead and take a break and let's come back at five after the hour and um, we'll pick back up on anticonvulsants here and we're going to finish up with the anxiety agents then I'm going to talk about some of the drugs that's used for, um, um, for sleep. So I'll see you at five after the hour. General anxiety disorder, but let's move to another class of drugs. Uh, one thing I would mention is just be aware that, um, uh, so for example, I will be speaking about, when we talk about mood disorders, we're going to be talking about a lot of these anticonvulsants too. And um, so in some of these other um, drugs, we may cover some more of the pharmacology, but it may be a little bit more specific for that particular, you know, for the particular um, uh, disorder that we're looking at. So occasionally anticonvulsants have been used um, to treat general anxiety disorder. Typically these are kicked in when um, we're looking at really as, um, as the patient is refractory. Um, so these have been tried. The concept or the rationale behind using these drugs really was that uh, these drugs uh, were believed to enhance GABA transmission. Okay. Um, when you look at the benzodiazepine, well, let's go back to, you know, ethanol and barbiturates, they all are going to be affecting uh, GABA. Um, so the, the point is, is that GABA is a uh, inhibitory type transmitter. So the concept here is that, <coughs> excuse me, the concept here is that um, if we enhance the inhibitory transmitter, that would give us some of these um, things with the benzodiazepines, okay? Um, the problem is, when we see this, I shouldn't say the problem, when we start using these drugs, a lot of times when you're going to use them off-label, a lot of people will start with the dosages or in the dosage range that um, we see being used on-label because uh, in one sense, those dosages have been shown to be safe and efficacious for those other conditions for which it was approved. So a lot of times they'll start low and, and, and go slow and maybe go up. But again, especially going off-label, that's, that's the issue. So there's been very limited uh, clinical trials uh, with these agents. Um, one of the issues uh, probably involves the, um, um, you know, as far as the drug companies as to whether it's going to be worth their while to try to, uh, to get this. But um, what we've seen is that basically um, the drugs that we've seen used have been um, gabapentin. Um, that has been... Um, one of the big ones that was used. And by the way, um, uh, and I'm, I don't know if we've talked about this or mentioned it before, but gabapentin has sort of moved into the limelight. Did I send you guys some um, 
the um, uh, Danielle, I forgot to do that, but yeah, we'll go over the quiz. Um, in fact, um, Aiden, if you can um, sort of bring that up, the last quiz, then um, when I get to the next stopping point, I'll go over that. I had thought about that at break and then I had forgotten about it. So thanks for bringing that up, Danielle. So um, when we, um, uh, so what I was gonna say is that gabapentin, um, what I was asking, has anyone um, seen the um, um, concerns or did I send you articles with regard to um, some concerns about abuse of gabapentin? That is um, uh, one of the things that's coming up that, um, and in fact, there's even been, I was in talking with, uh, uh, at a conference recently, someone was asking if the, um, um, is it uh, possible that the, um, this drug was gonna go to a scheduled drug, um, which uh, is something that's been discussed. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna go there, but we do see that it has um, moved into the, um, um, into sort of uh, where people that are abusing drugs are using GABA. But um, the uh, thing about it is, is that um, they have, um, um, uh, we even saw pregabalin pre um, was um, being examined for approval for treatment of, uh, of general anxiety disorder. But I was just double checking in. So far, pregabalin has not uh, been uh, approved that I'm aware of. It's been used for neuropathic pain and neuralgias and, and as an anticonvulsants, but I have not seen it, um, do not see where that it was potentially approved for use with this. But we've seen gabapentin, tigabin, and levetiracetam, and even pregabalin has been suggested. But again, these are not first-line agents. And the whole concept here is if you think about an anticonvulsant, it tends to produce some CNS depression that um, and going through the GABA transmission, that would uh, be where it comes from. Let me double check to see if this next sign. Yeah, so let's uh, take a quick step aside and let me go back to the quiz. And um, so from the quiz that you guys had um, when we broke for lunch, right before we broke for lunch, um, the first question was to decrease the chance of dependence which type of benzodiazepine is preferred? So the, the, the correct answer is what you want is a low potency, long half-life drug. Some people um, err on the fact of say, we want a short half-life because it gets out of the system. But what you end up with that short half-life is a lot of drugs that are abused have relatively short half-lives. So people are, it, it gets out of the system and then it allows for them to start setting up for cravings. So the correct answer is low potency, long half-life. Um, situational related anxiety, question number two, situational related anxiety should never be treated with drug therapy. There are people that would answer true to this, um, even though people do treat it. The correct answer is false. Um, it comes back to looking at how much it is affecting um, the individual. And then this becomes a benefit risk assessment. So if it is a situation where it is creating some major issues, then this can be treated. Many times it probably doesn't need to be treated or could be handled with something other than uh, drug therapy, but there are times when drug therapy is warranted. And then question three, which side effect of the tricyclic antidepressants is of concern when treating anxiety? It really comes to A, anticholinergic effects. That one is the one where we may get some tachycardia. Um, that is our biggest concern. If someone maybe has some anxiety, that's gonna increase their heart rate. Uh, we really don't see dependence or withdrawal uh, as major issues um, as to um, being the major concern there, and we don't see serotonin syndrome. So typically it's the anticholinergic aspects, okay? Thanks for reminding me, Daniel. So, um, um, and again, Aiden's got the answers and he'll put those on the, um, uh, on Moodle, I think. All right, so let's go to treatment of um, SAD, all right? So one of the big things that we see for treatment of SAD um, is uh, antidepressants. Antidepressants are extremely um, uh, commonly used 
Um, the ones we see, um, um, Effexor, Sertraline, Paroxetine, all of those have been approved by the FDA. Um, the thing about the antidepressants, as we've talked about several times today, is it does address the comorbidity of depression um, and other disorders. And um, we do see that, you know, many other SSRIs are actually used off-label. And what we basically see is that the efficacy across the class is about the same. So let's go back to this. Why would a drug, why wouldn't a drug company go ahead and go get this? Well, it, again, as a business, uh, unless, it, unless your drug really could give you a, a, that you could have some instance where that you were able to um, reap the benefits of the patent um, so that you, it wouldn't immediately go to a generic. And really, unless you had some drug that really outstood the others really significantly, there's really no business reason for doing that. So, um, so I think the answers you asked for was yes, it was BBA. Okay. So thanks, Gupta. So um, one of the things that you see is that the, the pretty much we see similar efficacy across the class. What you're going to see is, again, as we mentioned uh, before lunch, in discussion, why would you, you know, not why would you use another drug for treatment of GAD? The same thing with SAD is really should be um, yes, um, that's social anxiety disorder. So uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I got to the things that I complain to my students about sometimes of falling into uh, jargon and um, uh, 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 acronyms, and sometimes there is a crossover there. Yeah, the seasonal affective disorder, that, that is, uh, that's another weekend. So we don't have that weekend. We're not covering that this weekend. So, um, um, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, why would you use one over the other it gets back to one, it may be, it's one is on the insurance formulary and another one isn't. Two, and probably this, the most important reason is the clinician is more familiar or comfortable with a particular um, agent. Um, Sometimes you'll have a patient that'll come up and say, well, my friend uh, has the same type of symptoms I have and they're on uh, sertraline. So could I have sertraline and go off of paroxetine? And so, and um, from a standpoint of it is, you know, they may work both the same. And the biggest problem of sort of going with the patient's suggestion like that is it sort of sets up for the patient to start suggesting um, situations. Now, does it make a big difference between Paxil versus Sertraline? Probably not, but, um, you know, in, in other situations, drug may be different. So it's just one of those things that you would uh, be aware for. Um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, just like with everything else, these are, these are pretty good drugs, but they have so many potential food drug interactions that can, it creates problems. And so what we typically are going to reserve is monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Typically are going to be that refract, you know, when everything else doesn't work, they're off label. And sometimes with the MAOIs, just all the stuff you have to tell the patient to be careful of may actually increase some of their, um, their anxiety along with that. Um, the tricyclics uh, really haven't been shown to be too effective. One, one argument is maybe they have not been given enough of a trial. But, um, and the other thing is, is that uh, with the tricyclic, sometimes um, it's the side effect profile that occurs that may be more of an issue rather than efficacy. So, you know, you can have the best drug in the world, but uh, that can be very, very efficacious. But if the side effects are so bad or such bo so bothersome that the patient won't take them, then um, that becomes an issue. So, um, you know, again, when you're looking at whether a drug is effective, you're looking at does it work? And secondly is, does it uh, work without producing side effects that are, that are too bothersome where that the patient won't take it? Um, SAD benzos have been used. Um, we find that actually uh, there is more data on um, the uh, social anxiety um, disorder is um, we see the antidepressants actually are um, we have more data with regard to that. What we typically see when we're treating this is, is the use of um, Xanax or Clonopin. Those tend to be the, um, the two drugs that, uh, this is what I see a lot around here. I don't know what you guys see. But one of the things that you got to be careful about is in prescribing them. Again, some of the same things that we've talked about 
with the um, previously with the benzodiazepines, uh, we still have to be concerned about them. Um, we see these prescribed a lot of times PRN, and sometimes physicians are more likely to prescribe PRN. Um, some of their rationale is that the person would only take it as needed, but um, the downside to that is um, PRN sometimes gives the patient sort of a, um, you know, an open order to use it when you think you're using it, and sometimes they can overuse it. Um, because every time they think they are going to get into the situation, they will use it, so they become very dependent on it. The other thing we see is that with them not taking it regularly, we have a greater concern with potentially impairment. Um, if they're taking it on a regular basis, um, they develop tolerance to it. They pretty much know what's like, but when they're taking it just every now and then, and I've had <clears throat> instances where patients have uh, you know, he's got pulled over for a DUI. And uh, one of the things I always ask the attorney is, do we have a prescription? Does the patient have a prescription? Yes, he's got a prescription for it. The next question is, how recent is that prescription? So what I find is this patient has um, gone to, um, um, you know, to the doctor. And three months ago, the doctor gave him a prescription of uh, for Xanax, PRN, and the patient is still working on that one, that first prescription. So they haven't even used 30 tablets. So the patient takes it, gets in the car and drive, then shows signs of you know sedation or whatever, um, is very hard to fight because there's not had enough time for tolerance. So that's uh, one of the concerns with using the benzodiazepines is um, one is the patient tending to use it anytime they need it. Those type of patients are gonna be showing up at your uh, office with multiple prescriptions or wanting to get prescriptions filled frequently. Um, and that can set up sometimes for you know abuse of this. Um, the other thing is, is that let's say the patient is taking it only as needed. It means that every time, if they take one today and maybe they have sort of a reaction to it, it makes them sort of sleepy. Um, and maybe on Sunday it's fine because they can rest the night, but let's say they take it before going to work tomorrow uh, or you know the end of the week, something comes up and they take it um, you know, before going to work, because it's going to be uh, some issues there. And basically what you see is that that person is sort of sedated or has some of these side effects. So it's one of the concerns we have when it is PRN. Um, beta, beta blockers, we talked about these. Um, the, the, the use of them emerged because when they were used to treat performance anxiety, and this is where sort of people think is, anxiety is anxiety is anxiety, but we find that um, actually beta blockers um, used for SAD, uh, the efficacy is really minimal. And I'm not even so sure if the efficacy is more the beta blocker versus it is um, you know, more of a placebo effect, I don't know. We do see some peripheral actions and one of the biggest concerns, what would you think the peripheral actions would be? What do you think the patient's gonna complain about or may present with? We used to see propranolol um, uh, prescribed quite a bit. We're seeing more people going to things like metoclolol. Um, atenolol or natolol uh, can give you reduced amount of dosages, uh, or about you know, two once a day dosage. Um, the biggest thing people will tell you is with the beta blockers is going to say my heart rate slows down. Um, sometimes they will describe being fatigued um, we see sometimes individuals that exercise that are using their heart rate to monitor how fit they are, like runners, the beta blockers do not work. Um, but sometimes patients will tell you on beta blockers, they just, I mean, we see this from patients that have, uh, re, um, survived heart attacks. They'll tell you the beta blocker just doesn't make them feel good. They're tired and things like that. Um, propranolol actually gets into the brain pretty good and we actually may get some sedation with them, but typically we see less sedation um, with the beta blockers than the benzodiazepines, but on the other hand, the beta blockers don't work as well. The tendency sometimes is to keep increasing the dose of the beta blocker and you got to worry about um, a, um, you got to really worry about uh, drops in blood pressure, you know, beta blockers are used to lower blood pressure they will definitely lower your heart rate. And so that is uh, the case. Typically, we tell them to take it about 30 minutes before the event when we're using it for performance anxiety. And as I said, the side effects are mainly extensions of the pharmacology. 
okay? Um, what we have found when with situational or performance anxiety, uh, the benzos usually worsen the performance because people are uh, too relaxed, maybe drowsy, sometimes dizzy. Um, so the beta blockers for the situational for performance anxiety have shown some benefit for treatment of SAD, um, really very, very minimal. Um, anticonvulsants, um, GABA and uh, levetiracetam, they've been used off-label, not first-line drugs. Um, there has been some efficacy evidence for them being effective, um, very little on that. Big thing is, unlike the benzos, I mean, yeah, unlike benzos, we don't have to worry about an abuse potential, although I will qualify that with some of the data on gabapentin, and I'm going to try to send you guys um, some issues with regard to gabapentin. Those, those may not go up tonight, but I will send them to you. I'm not going to test you on those, but I think it's just something so you'll be aware of some of the issues with gabapentin and substance abuse, okay? Um, Pregabalin has been shown, has shown some efficacy in um, social anxiety disorder, um, not to the extent of the other, of the SSRIs. So let's move to treatment of panic disorder, okay? Um, panic disorder is, um, can really affect a lot of people. Uh, we don't really know what's optimal duration of therapy, okay? Um, most people are saying, you know, what we like to do is to prevent relapse occurring. And a lot of people sort of advocate that probably treatment for a year, for a year is probably warranted. Um, the treatments that we see, we've got two drugs that are actually have been um, approved by the FDA. Both are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so paroxetine and sertraline. Um, we have seen tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors have shown some efficacy. Again, the biggest concern with TCAs and MAOIs are basically side effects or uh, interactions. Um, the thing about the um, antidepressants, as we see with people with panic disorder, a lot of time they have components of both depression and anxiety, so it sort of addresses both. Um, but here's a key point. This is more so than some of the other conditions we've done. It's extremely important to start with low dosages and slowly escalate. One of the things that can happen is if you start uh, with these drugs, you start at um, too high of a um, dosage, uh, you may get some activation, some jitteriness. And one of the things is, is people with these panic disorders are extremely sensitive to side effects. So this is a very important component here, is basically their body seems to be very sensitive. So side effects of drugs can sort of kick off these things. So they, they literally have this fear of these physical sensations. So if we give them a drug and this drug basically starts creating some side effects, this creates a problem. So it's very important that we start slow and slowly escalate this, slowly increase the drugs to try to avoid this aspect of it because they, you know, sometimes this can trigger a panic effect, panic uh, disorder. Um, we do see other SSRIs. They're used simply, they're off-label simply because they've not been approved. Um, some other things um, that we've seen with panic disorder is that um, um, the SNRIs, basically Effexor and Duloxetine, um, they've been off-label, used off-label, and the basis for using those off-label is that there was a positive double-blind placebo-controlled um, um, study done with Effexor. And so um, that is the basis for using these and trying these. Um, we've also seen some of the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, riboxetine. Um, but the TCAs and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, again, all of these are off-label, but they're usually used um, as when somebody has been refractory to treatment. And um, so they're sort of used as sort of the last, the last uh, type of agents that are used there. With um, 
the benzos, um, alprazolam and clonopin, uh, actually with the people around here, I've seen more clonopin being used than alprazolam. Um, the problem with using the low potency agents is basically the doses you need are pretty higher or pretty high compared to for other conditions. And typically what happens is the uh, dose that you need for treating panic disorder is going to be um, too sedating. Um, so that's an issue. But typically I've seen more clonopin than alprazolam and definitely uh, um, I've seen occasionally with lorazepam being used. Uh, Buspirone has um, not been shown to work well with panic disorder but uh, as monotherapy, but what we've seen it used is sometimes it can be used to, to augment the um, SSRIs. So you would put them on an SSRI and then if that doesn't work, just tweak it maybe with Buspirone. And then anticonvulsants have also been used off-label for the panic disorder. The, um, how do you treat phobias? Um, the, um, we have seen sometimes that if it's very severe, uh, we do see um, benzodiazepines being used, typically as PRN. I think as we talked about a little bit yesterday, somebody's fixing to take a flight, uh, sometimes they may be given you know, some Xanax or Ativan to sort of help them uh, calm down. Um, typically, we, um, the biggest concern we have with treating phobias is that um, the person taking it all the time would be sedated. Now, some people, that sedation may be fine for them. Other people you might think is if they have, depending on the fear or phobia they have, it might be they're afraid to, you know, be sedated that much. But occasionally they are used PRN, but just like I said earlier, when we're talking about using benzodiazepines, PRN, we, we have to be careful from a standpoint of the uh, side effects from taking a dose every now and then, the side effects um, being more prominent. And definitely in elderly patients, um, with them using PR, uh, any of the benzodiazepines as PRN, probably put them at a higher risk for uh, particularly falls. Let's look at treatment of OCD. Um, we've got a number of drugs that have been found to be effective in OCD. Um, most of these are antidepressants. Uh, we've got uh, clomipramine, fluvoxamine, fluoxetine, peroxetine, sertraline. Um, again, if there is some comorbid depression, this works well. Um, citalopram and escitalopram were never approved for OCD, but they have been used off-label, as has Effexor. And again, one of the big things is people are pretty much just, um, um, you know, the idea is if the drugs that have been approved, they're acting through the same mechanism, therefore these other drugs should use. What we do see is that typically the benzodiazepines uh, are generally not effective for use in OCD. Um, we have seen, and um, many times if the, SSRI alone does not completely control it. Uh, we can augment it, and people have used buspirone. Um, people have added, I've seen clonopin used uh, sometimes with the SSRIs. Um, and sometimes we even see some of the antipsychotics, things like haloperidol, pimazine, risperidone, olanzapine, quidipine. We'll go into these drugs a lot more um, when we talk about schizophrenia. But these can be used to augment it, and they probably are acting through their interaction with the dopaminergic system that maybe handles movement. And we'll go into great detail about the benzodiazepines in a couple of weeks with, but not benzos, with the antipsychotics, with the neuro um, um, substrates that these interact with. And clomipramine has also been used to augment the SSRIs. Um, let's see, um, Joy, you've worked with a lot of people with body dysmorphic disorder. And um, um, with and with those individuals, um, they they do have OCD like components there. Um, I have seen patients that um, are on high doses of Prozac. Um, I don't know if I would call it standard treatment, but I have seen that. I have seen patients that have um, been when reviewing charts that are with the body dysmorphic. Um, the other thing was sometimes this body dysmorphic, we found that the Prozac 
is using to treat sometimes the uh, some eating disorders that may be associated with it. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily the standard treatment, but I would say it's not uncommon. Now, um, PTSD, and again, you guys, you're going to get an article tonight, or a couple of articles tonight for you to read. I'm not going to test you on the article. So I'm going to send you or have um, Aiden post this week um, a couple of things. And I just need to make myself a note so I won't forget when we stop in a little bit. There we go. So let me. Um, Take these notes. Um, and the other, so I'm gonna give you an article on GAB and drug abuse, and the other is gonna be the uh, articles my student um, uh, did with, um, I think it was praises and ketamine USD. Doctor, meanwhile, I just run the attendance poll that you are looking okay. for your article. Yeah, I'll send those later, but. Um, you guys take a moment, go ahead and answer the attendance poll. We'll take about two or three minutes here just to let you guys respond to that. I'm going to decrease the poll. And I do not know why I got this um, line in the middle, but go ahead and respond to the, um, to the attendance poll. And then I'm going to start talking about PTSD treatment. So one of the things with PTSD is, and how many of you patient, how many of you guys work with patients with PTSD? I'm just curious. I know there's a couple of you at least, if not more. Okay. Okay. So several of you do, actually more than I thought did. Okay. Um, so one of the things you find is, is that there's always the concern about uh, the relapse. And, um, and then also you've got a lot of patients that you know, basically, what happens is um, you uh, the PDS tree treatment. We we're wanting to prevent those relapses. Um, we also see that some of these, um, especially with patients that don't respond well to the initial intervention, we definitely want to try to keep the thing because they didn't respond to the initial uh, as well. Um, basically, it may be hard to keep them in the thing. So we've seen a lot of. And by the way, just out of curiosity, what are you? Those of you that are working or have worked with PDSD patients. What drug therapies did you guys have to see them on? Um, we had a couple of, um, you know, um, uh, we, we see a lot of um, the um, uh, antidepressants used um, from a standpoint of, um, um, you know, just uh, dealing with a lot of comorbidities. Um, so, uh, and so SSRIs and prazosin, um, the prazosin for the nightmares and antidepressants. One of the things that you do see quite a bit is the nightmares seem to be a major issue that they broke, them, broke off on them. Sometimes these patients, um, one of the things will be is that the SSRIs um, have been found to treat these. Um, the, you have a lot of comorbidities with some of these individuals. They may have depression and may have other anxiety disorders. So one of the concepts of using antidepressants is that you can address several of these comorbidities. Um, the, um, we see a lot of things, a lot of the other antidepressants, almost all the other antidepressants classes have been used off label. And again, I think the main thought process is trying to address a lot of the comorbidities. But as many of you just indicated, um, one of the big concerns is the bins, is the nightmares. Um, one thing that we used to see quite a bit is a lot of benzodiazepines used several years ago. Okay, um, what we found was that these high potency agents, clonopin, alprazolam. Um, the reality of it is, people were thinking, okay, these are have a lot of anxiety disorders, have sleep disorders. We'll use these um, agents. <clears throat> what you actually saw was looking at the clinical evidence on um, the concern as to whether these drugs uh, really were efficacious was questionable. Um, but again, think about this is several years ago, 
the benzodiazepines came out. They were touted as being extremely safe. Everybody was raving over them. It was the new drug. Um, people seemed to be able to take in function. And so it was natural that somebody would say, well, let's move to the benzos. Really, the biggest issue we ran into with the benzodiazepines comes down to that um, the concern for substance abuse. Because number one is a lot of the comorbidities that may exist with, the, um, with PTSD may also result in the issues associated with, um, uh, they also come with them a risk of, of abuse. And if you're prescribing benzodiazepines for this condition, it can very quickly be abused. Some of these individuals may have chronic pain situation going on because coming from a war zone, the PTSD may be because they were uh, wounded and may be taking medications. And when you throw the benzodiazepine in with several other um, things, uh, other narcotics and CNS depressants, it's easy for suicide to occur, okay? So really with treatment of PTSD, um, the concern for specifically abuse, maybe sometimes suicide, argues really against them being used routinely, okay? Um, some people have tried buspirone, okay, but not really great. Uh, anticonvulsants um, have shown to have, you know, potentially, but a lot of these with going with some of these other things like anticonvulsants and buspirone, um, the concern is it's like the other stuff hasn't worked as well. So, there was a move to, um, there's been some things that actually, um, uh, that's a good point, Eddie, is basically they, those can also interfere with the habituation. So then there was a move to start looking at um, sympatholytic drugs, beta blockers, alpha receptor agonists, which alpha receptor agonists, they, in the central nervous system, actually decrease the sympathetic nervous tone and alpha receptor antagonists. And there's been some interesting data that's come out is, for example, um, shown that beta blockers that were given just within a few hours of the traumatic event, um, there was a suggestion that they may, that may actually reduce the chance of actually developing PTSD. And um, the, um, the um, issue is that with that is they, they didn't produce an, an amnesia but it might actually block the explicit memories that characterize the, uh, the situation that, uh, that triggered this. So uh, that was an issue. And then alpha-2 agonists, clonidine, guanfacine, um, those actually showed some, um, some efficacy. Um, and then, but we, what we found was actually alpha-1 antagonist prazosin has been, has sort of moved to the forefront. Um, the, let's see, Eddie, I'm going to have to look at the d cyclist um, serine um, with that one to, um, I'll need to check on that one. So I'll do that. Make myself a note here. Maybe I can get some additional stuff when we have uh, our break. So what we find, and sometimes atypical antipsychotics have been used off label, but what we're really seeing is a lot of the things is we'll see the antidepressant and then as, uh, let's see, who was it? Uh, Janelle is we'll see uh, almost several of you saw that the, um, the um, out prazosin has been moved up to the front for using. Our biggest concern with prazosin is really comes down to the issue of, um, um, from a standpoint of um, uh, blood pressure drop. Okay, so um, that's, uh, I'm gonna send you these two papers one on prazosin, which gives a little bit more information. There's one on ketamine, which has been looked. I'm a little concerned with ketamine uh, from a standpoint of it potentially moving into this. Um, uh, the way it would be dosed um, alleviates a little bit of my fear, but from a standpoint of the potential for abuse of it, it does create a, uh, a concern with me on that. Now, I've got a couple, a few more slides here, and we're going to go through these few slides, and then when we take our break, which will be the last break for the day, um, I'm gonna change slide sets to go to that second set of slides. So when you look at it, this is probably not an all-inclusive list, but uh, on this, uh, I don't, this is really not anything that you need to study. It sort of gives you an idea of some of the drugs that have been used for treatment of anti-anxiety agents. Um, I'm not going to ask you the daily dosage uh, or anything like that, but again, this is more for your reference. And um, 
then, well, let me cover this because we'll cover this. One of the things we do see is um, a lot of people that have anxiety disorders um, want to go to herbs. And in fact, we see that a large, in fact, this is probably one of the major reasons people will go to herbals. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, Monica, your question about would antidepressants such as well butrin that can cause vivid dreams be contraindicated for PTSD? I'm not aware that it is. Um, and it is a possible, I don't know, has anybody else any experience with well butrin and people with PTSD? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'll see if I can get some, um, see if I can find an answer for that. If I can find a paper, I'll put that in there too. All right, so we see a lot of people try it. And actually, one study showed that uh, approximately 45% of patients with anxiety use some form of complementary therapy. All right, so I picked a few um, very common, um, um, a, a common anti-anxiety herbals. Go to koala, guaranas, kava, lemongrass, valerian. And just from a standpoint of, you know, looking at what we had there, is there's not a lot of study, clinical studies that have been done with these. Um, go to koala, there was a single dose study. They get, took 12 grams. Uh, they measured the acoustic startle response and showed that it was uh, diminished at 60 and 90 minutes, um, but there was no change in self-rated anxiety. Um, Garana is when people, this was a randomized controlled trial with 30 individuals. Um, they had placebo versus um, um, Caffeine versus Garana. Actually, it's funny, Arnold, is that I don't consider that an herbal, but CBD oil and these type of things are um, coming into play. So um, we, you know, pharmacologically, we still separate out the marijuana, but CBD oil falls into the category of not a herbal, but as a supplement. And um, so that's, that's actually Cannabis and all these other things are redefining a lot of things uh, that's coming into play here. I've been doing, a, um, been asked to do a lot of talks on CBD oil and um, that sort of thing. So if you guys need uh, information about CBD oil and some concerns, um, I can get you guys some papers on that. Um, so basically with Garana, um, when they did this random control trial, granted it was only 30 patients, really no significant effects on anxiety. Um, Kava, um, there was a placebo controlled, randomized controlled trial. Uh, there was a significant reduction of anxiety. This was sort of known as the herbal um, benzodiazepine. They did see some adverse effects that seemed to be mild and transient. Um, we used to be careful, have to be cautious because Kava um, on the shelf and somebody taking benzodiazepines, in fact, the first herbal drug interaction, I think, was between kava and a benzodiazepine. Lemongrass, we've seen a placebo, double-blind, randomized controlled trouble. That only showed a single dose, looked at it 30 minutes later. So it was very, you know, some of these clinical trials have been very um, uh, questionable with regard to uh, drawing any conclusions. Valerian, see this used a lot for more for sleep. Um, what they compared it to is diazepam, um, double-blind, randomized control trial, no difference. But again, most of these studies have been very, very small, and um, uh, it's hard to draw conclusions because it's limited data that's there. So what we, what we see is that with herbals in general, limited number of randomized control trials, even the ones that's been done, small number of patients, there's one of the big things is there's a lot of variation between these herbal preps. Um, so there may be other constituents and stuff there that may be an issue. Um, kava is the only one that, uh, that had multiple randomized controls, but we do see that kava is banned in many countries due to concern with the patotoxicity. Another thing with herbals is that um, we've had a lot of herbals that may come in and be spiked with, um, with drugs, sometimes with toxic compounds. Um, so that makes that very difficult to really do. But you need to be aware if your patients are taking supplements or herbals. 
There are a number of medications you just need to be aware of that can produce anxiety. So when you're doing a workup is checking to see if any of these medications are on board. You wanna look at when they were taken. Um, a couple of that you may not have thought about is ant some of the antibiotics, uh, some of the cephalosporins, which are very commonly uh, prescribed, oxifloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone. These are, uh, cephalosporins are very commonly prescribed. Uh, corticosteroids, I think most people are aware that a lot of the corticosteroids can produce um, these type of things. But these are things that when you're doing your assessment, you need to consider that or is the anxiety being produced by that. Uh, we talked about decongestants earlier today, pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine. Here's one, people don't recognize this, but NSAIDs in some patients, this is rare, but NSAIDs uh, in particular, ibuprofen, which is available over the counter, can produce um, some anxiety. And then stimulants we talked about with ADHD drugs, caffeine, and then thyroid hormones or thyroid hormone extracts. Um, abrupt draw of CNS depressants, we've talked about that. And then be aware also of drug toxicity, anticholinergics, antihistamines, and then digoxin. Um, people that are taking digoxin for uh, atrial fibrillation, I think it's the main reason they take it, or for atrial arrhythmia, um, can produce some anxiety. It does get into the brain. This last couple of slides is just sort of a, um, let me get back to this. These are just sort of a summary slide to sort of help you. So here are antidepressants that have been used. Again, I'm not gonna ask you for on the test to be able to tell me what drug is being, or what dosage they're being used at. Um, here's some of the benzodiazepines. Now, I'm not gonna ask you on the test, but one of the things that may be helpful for you is looking at the half-life. So this chart is good for giving you half-life. And also the Tmax, and what the Tmax is, that's the time in which you get the maximal concentration of the drug. So you would expect the maximal effect in these benzodiazepines, especially with regard to sedation and side effects, to be occurring in this range here. And then these are antidepressants that have been used for treatment of panic disorder. Again, not gonna ask you any dosages. Okay, so I think that finishes up the slides for this section. I'm going to, we're gonna take a break now and um, let's come back on the hour. I'm gonna cover the sleep medications and um, then we'll finish up with the, um, with the test and that I will send to you uh, or send it to Aiden. It'll be a three question test and we'll go from there. So let's pick back up on the hour and I'm going to change slides, so I'm going to mute out here. What I want to cover is just some sleep disorders, and uh, because some of the drugs that we see, um, for example, um, Ambien and those sort of fit in with this, and we do see that the, uh, uh, with regard to the, um, the situation with um, um, anxiety, a lot of times insomnia is a is a concern and or is an issue there. So one of the things that we're doing seeing this is um, um, a big concern that sometimes we used to see the, um, um, used to see a lot of people using benzodiazepine. When we look at sleep disorders, um, what you really look at is the, the major category really falls into insomnia, which we have a lot of people that suffer from insomnia. We have narcolepsy, we have restless leg syndrome, um, obstructive sleep apnea has come to that as something that you would not necessarily treat, but you might have patients with it. And then parasomnias, which get sort of linked into um, some of the things that, um, some of these drugs that we're using. So with insomnia, basically people, the prevalence increases with age, although I will tell you, it's usually recognized that teenagers are probably the most sleep deprived. But, you know, just from a standpoint of, you know, with my, as I'm, you know, I'm 64 and, um, you know, what's a normal night's sleep for me is I will go to bed typically around midnight and, um, and I'll be, I'll wake up around 630. Um, sometimes I've stayed up, you know, till one and, you know, so typically is 
you know, a six hour night sleep does pretty well for me. Um, I do know that sometimes when I've got a lot of stuff going on, that one of the issues that comes into play sometimes is, is a big thing with regard to, um, you know, I may start dozing off a little bit. Um, we see it's greater in females, about one and a half times more so in females. And um, we do see that uh, about a third of elderly patients, greater than 65, so I don't fall in that category yet. Um, but we find um, that a lot of times this is a symptom of some underlying disorder, just like we've talked about this weekend, that people with anxiety um, can do that, people with depression. Uh, one of the other things we see is pain. Um, I mean, some of the times I've had what I consider insomnia has been when I'm hurting, can't get to sleep. Thyroid uh, dysfunction can, can cause it. Um, GERD, very common thing with GERD. People eat heavy meals at night or eat a lot at night, get that midnight snack. And then the next thing you know is they've got indigestion, which keeps them awake. So um, we see, you know, one of the main things with insomnia is really trying to find out what the cause is. And a lot of times it's not giving a sleeping pill but rather to um, basically identify um, and try to correct the cause. A lot of things is sleep hygiene. There's been a lot of research coming out with regard to, you know, electronics and setting up, you know, being on computer for long periods of time before you go to bed and stuff like that. So, um, and, and people are less, I know talking to students, they're less likely to want to uh, change their sleep hygiene. Um, Narcolepsy is another one. I have had one student in all the years that I'm aware of that had narcolepsy. Um, we do see it has a higher prevalence in the Japanese population. Um, Israeli populations have a lower population, but uh, about 50 to 80% of the patients that have narcolepsy, they have this cataplexy, which is this sudden transient loss of muscle tone. And um, that can be, um, um, they can just sort of collapse. So let's talk, we'll start with narcolepsy to begin with, and we'll end up with the other ones. So the pathophysiology is we believe the narcolepsy is probably an autoimmune disorder. Um, specifically, there seems to be a problem with the, um, there seems to be a problem with the, um, um, with the uh, HLA, which is the major histocompatibility complex, specifically the DQB1 asterisk 0602, and the DQ1A1 asterisk 0102. So what happens is apparently the, um, the um, situation is, is that the, um, the body attacks um, the cells that secrete a compound known as hypocretin, which is produced in the hypothalamus, okay? So this seems to be where the attack occurs. What happens with hypocretin is basically the neurons that secrete hypocretin um, that stimulates arousal and cortical activation. So with an autoimmune disease that is destroying these, um, these neurons, basically what's going to happen is our ability to get that um, secretion of hypocretin to have arousal and cortical activation goes down. Another condition we have, I'm sort of just going through the conditions and then we're gonna talk about the treatment. Another condition is restless leg syndrome, which is sort of interesting, uh, referred to as RLS, because for a long time, they, there was a debate as to whether the drug companies um, actually um, is actually going to um, um, made that up, that there is no such, there's still people believe there's no such thing as restless leg syndrome. And um, so, um, Joy, it's, um, yeah, it should progress or it gets to the point where the narcolepsy is showing that. So um, that does, it gets to a point where that it, it gradually increases and it does get uh, worse over time. But usually we're starting to treat it before then. So with the restless leg syndrome, uh, we know this is suggested to occur at about 5 to 15% of the population. We see, a lot of people didn't know about it until the drug companies that was putting out uh, drugs to treat it started advertising it and talking about RLS and people will talk about, oh yeah, uh, when I try to go to sleep, my, I'm constantly moving my legs and sometimes, you know, their significant other is saying I can't sleep because not only do they snore, but they're like kicking their legs around and so forth. But we also see that uh, it's not uncommon to see this with patients that are, uh, have end-stage renal disease that uh, during pregnancy or during iron deficiency. 
And um, people have suggested there's a genetic link because we see about 63 to 92% of the patients report that there's a family positive history. So we do see um, that from a standpoint of um, uh, it may definitely be there. Uh, but again, when this came out, a lot of people didn't uh, to think of it. But what it is, is basically people have this irresistible desire to move your legs. So basically, it's like you've just got to move them. And um, um, one of the theories is that there is an iron deficiency, and that fits in with pregnancy because a lot of women become iron deficient. It fits in with renal disease because a lot of those individuals um, develop uh, deficiencies there. But apparently what they believe is that there may be an iron deficiency or the, some sort of dysfunction in, in how the body handles the iron in the central nervous system. So the net effect is that when you have these abnormalities, uh, specifically in the basal ganglia, that ultimately affects um, dopaminergic transmission. So there's a link between the iron deficiency and the dopaminergic uh, transmission. Another sleep condition we have is obstructive sleep apnea. We see this affecting a large number of people. You see ads for CPAP machines all the time. Uh, in women, the obstructive sleep apnea seems to increase after menopause. We see it more common in African Americans, less common in Asians, and it tends to increase with age and it tends to increase with obesity. And in fact, one of the things that we see is basically that um, the concern seems to be that um, when the person sleeps, the upper airway sort of collapses and the airflow stops. And then what happens is they get woken up because they're having difficulty breathing. Um, what we, how we diagnose it is they do sleep studies and this exact sleep study is called a nocturnal polysomnography. And what they do is they count the number of respiratory disturbance index, which is referred to as an RDI. So that uh, you're considered to have mild apnea if you have five to 15 episodes per hour, and severe apnea is if you're more than 30 episodes per hour. So if you're looking at severe, that means the person about every other second uh, or every other minute is having a sleep disturbance or is having uh, an apneic response. What we find is that we recognize that a lot of individuals that the fatter your neck, you get fat deposition in your neck, that tends to cause your airway to collapse. Um, the other thing is, is if you have negative airway during inspiration, negative pressure in your airway, or a small jawbone. So basically, if you notice the different things that are used for sleep apnea is one, CPAP is a uh, forced pressure that increases the pressure blowing air through there. Sometimes positioning the jawbone or wearing mouthpieces can facilitate that. Um, losing weight uh, or maybe getting pillows to adjust where the, the, there's less push down on that. But the net effect happens is that when people don't sleep, they keep waking up and they don't realize they may wake up all the time, but they wake up next time they're, they have a lot of daytime sleepiness because basically they're not getting a good deep sleep. Their sleep is very fragmented. Also, that increased alteration in oxygenation affects the cardiovascular system. And that's usually coupled with somebody that they have you know, excessive fat on them, which may, they already may be at risk for cardiovascular disease also. And then another thing we have is as far as a sleep disorder is parasomnias. And what we find here, these include things as sleep talking, um, bruxism, which is grinding your teeth, um, maybe sleepwalking, sleep terrors, um, wetting your bed, enuresis. Um, we do see people have nightmares. Um, occurs both in adults and children. And um, so we see these parasomnies occur and these have actually become um, even more at, uh, brought to the forefront based upon some of the issues associated with um, some of the sleep medications. And then when we're treating insomnia, um, looking at the various insomnias, one, first of all, we need to find the root of it. Um, the ideal drug, what we would do is it would let us go to sleep quicker. Um, it would increase the time we're in sleep and wouldn't have any side effects. Well, you know good and well, we don't have any drug with no side effects, okay? 
So what we've seen that has been approved by the FDA for treating of insomnia, benzodiazepines initially, but the concern was the addiction issue and so forth. And those got replaced with really Zolpidem and Zalpalon, which are, these two are sometimes referred to as the non-benzodiazepine uh, drugs. And then also uh, esopicolone, um, which has been used, um, approved for use for chronically for up to six months. Now this doesn't also include melatonin, uh, which is another common thing that's, um, 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 that, you know, that is, um, uh, is used. So the benzodiazepines we talked about earlier today, they bind to the GABA receptor, we get more chloride. Just the way they work today in anxiety is the same thing. Typically what we're gonna see is um, that it's going to, um, uh, the biggest things is the doses we use for sleep for benzodiazepines usually is a little bit larger than what we would use for treating anxiety. Um, most of these drugs which we see used, which include the benzodiazepines, and the non-benzos, they, they reduce sleep latency, which means you fall asleep uh, quicker and that you get an increased um, total sleep time. Zalpalon doesn't uh, give us all of those. Our biggest concern is the hangover the next day with these patients. It's called residual sed sedation. Um, the other thing is psychomotor impairment because even though <clears throat> all of these drugs can make people feel, I mean, it can basically create confusion if they're seeing us depressants. And we also see abuse potential, which can occur more frequently with the, um, um, with the benzos, but we still see abuse of Ambien. One of the things that's happened with Ambien is people are, kids are abusing it, kids, I say teenagers, young adults, uh, what they do is take very high doses of Ambien, and then they try to stay awake as long as they can, results in sleep deprivation, plus the effects, gets them on a little bit of a buzz. So what we wanna do is we pretty much try to pick a benzodiazepine or a drug in general that sort of matches its duration of action would match the patient's um, time that they're planning on sleeping. Um, so for example, if we want a long sleep, we don't use a benzodiazepine or short acting age. We start with low dosages and um, the, um, definitely we don't want uh, long acting benzodiazepines in the elderly because they, would, um, they can accumulate. Most of these drugs will produce anterograde amnesia. So basically after the person takes the drug, they may not remember what occurred from the time they took the drug. This is usually dose dependent, which means that basically uh, the higher the dose, the more likely this is to occur. We do see um, some rebound insomnia, especially with the benzodiazepines person comes off of it. We find it sometimes one to two nights after coming off the drug. Uh, even if we withdraw them, we may still see it. Um, this is more frequently with the short acting benzos. But again, a lot of times, you, you know, you're going to tell the patient, look, you're not going to get back the insomnia. This is fairly common. And so we, we have to assure them that this is not, and we also have to make sure that it actually isn't going to occur. Um, some of the sedating antidepressants have been used, trazodone, for example, um, amitriptyline, doxepin. see a lot of trazodone being used, and we have also seen some um, antipsychotics that have some sedation have been used. Um, the clinical studies with regard to these antidepressants has really, they've never really been evaluated for their sleep-inducing activities, so we don't have any clinical studies for them really being used for sleep. Um, but what we've seen is people have recognized that drugs like trazodone, I have a friend who basically trazodone is um, uh, the preferred, they don't like Ambien, but trazodone works really well. Um, know a couple of people that are using doxepin. So um, again, some of the side effects um, with some of these other drugs is they are anticholinergic, so they can sometimes create dryness of the mouth. Um, they may uh, affect um, uh, bladder control a little bit. Biggest thing here is probably carryover sedation. Um, people need to know that they can get up in the morning and not be have a hung, hangover, uh, grogginess. Um, any of the drugs that some of these older agents like the amitriptyline and, and doxepin may have uh, some weight gain. Um, the other thing that can happen sometimes is with some of these drugs, we can have sleep eating, 
So this is a parasomnia. People get up and eat. We have sleep cooking and people, my wife is, she sometimes will, she takes Ambien and will sometimes experience sleep eating. And she always, you know, she says this, I have to quit taking this stuff is causing me to gain weight. It's because she's getting up at night and eating. Um, be very careful in using in the elderly. Uh, a lot of times we say avoid using in the elderly. This is more with the benzodiazepines, but again, um, when we do it, we got to be concerned. We want, we're concerned about the elderly being too impaired. Um, the elderly trying to get up at night, um, trying to move around subject to falls. So we have to be very cautious, but we do use these in the elderly, but you know, again, have to be very, very careful. Benadryl is one of the drugs approved by the FDA. Um, uh, straight old antihistamine, use 20 to 50 milligrams. You can buy it over the counter like Unisom. Um, people tend to fall asleep um, quicker and they tend to sleep longer. Um, we do see some daytime sedation. We do see weight gain that can occur with this. It's an antihistamine. And we do see some anticholinergic effects. So these sometimes, um, the biggest problem we see is a lot of these uh, effects being more when they first start them, or if they start taking larger, the more, do, more of, the, of the drug than they uh, should be taken. Um, valerian root has been one of these herbals that has been suggested. Uh, typically four to 900 milligrams, but a lot of inconsistent uh, results. Some people swear by it, other people say it doesn't work. This may be due to variations in the preparations. I do know a lot of people say it tastes horrible, um, but people have used valerian root and it can be a CNS depressant. So it can have an additive effects um, by uh, of increasing CNS depression. Um, Remelteon basically came out before the Ambien and everything. Uh, it was a melatonin receptor agonist, so acted like melatonin. Um, this was pretty effective for insomnia um, with uh, where people had difficulty in sleeping going onset. But one of the things about um, this particular drug is when Ambien went generic, uh, the market for this dropped down quite a bit. So we don't see this prescribed nearly as much, even though it is a non-controlled drug. It's not a scheduled drug. But everybody has jumped on the Ambien and the Lunesta type uh, bandwagon. But I know one of the reps that worked for the company that had this, and they just, they said they're, basically everything took a dive as soon as the Ambien went generic. Let's see. I, um, there we go. I go. Yeah. When you look at the different drugs used for um, insomnia, uh, I'm not interested that you know, uh, you know the doses or anything like that. I'm not going to ask you what the half life, but just give you a couple of things. Is for example, what we I'd say say the drugs that are more frequently used um, we see is Lunesta. That's remember when Lunesta its commercial came out. Uh, the big thing was it was the flying moth. That's a lunar moth. We used to kid people that you take this and you dream about these large moths landing on you while you slept. Um, we've seen um, um, Rosirum used, uh, Restoril. Don't see as much Halcyon, but probably um, we do see um, Zolpidem, I think, would probably be the number one and uh, also Sonata. But I would say of what I see in Zulpid MCR, of the ones that I see, one of the things that, I mean, I would say probably the Ambien and the um, um, Lunesta are the two most common ones that I see other than, and I didn't mention Trazodone. Uh, Trazodone, that's the other one I see. One of the big things that has come out has been this emergence of these parasomnias. And a big thing that's happened is there has been the recommendation by the FDA to decrease the maximal dose of uh, Ambien to 10 milligrams, and even with the 12 and a half to go down. Um, the, um, the idea is, as far as the recommended course of treatment, um, theoretically these were made for the short term, so going long term is off label, but I see um, exactly what you see. My wife has been on the medication on Ambien for years, and um, so you do see a lot of people taking this, for long periods of time. Um, 
Um, so it's it really one of the things is what you'd like to do in an ideal world is you would want to improve sleep hygiene, use the drugs initially, and hopefully move away off the drugs, but we just don't. One of the big things is going to be is the sleep hygiene is one of the major things of trying to get people to um, to subscribe to start doing that. They just it's just one of the things they don't do. So um, so we do see people on them for long periods of time, and we have seen a lot of sleep driving that has occurred. That's been fairly common um, that has come up. But if you're prescribing these drugs, you need to definitely take a look at the um, at the Medicaid, at the uh, FDA um, guides, the FDA just came out just recently. I think it was this last year, with an additional warning about um, the um, um, Ambien and those type of drugs. Now, with treatment of narcolepsy, what we try to do is we try to have them schedule naps, and we try to use some stimulant drugs to keep them awake during the day. So, one of the drugs that's been used is modafinil. Um, it's a Schedule Four. Um, this um, works pretty well, and basically, um, this is ProVigil. Um, the biggest thing we see sometimes is a little bit of CNS stimulation, maybe some increases in blood pressure and heart rate is a concern, but most people, once they're on it, do pretty well. We do see modinafil prescribed for daytime sleepiness a lot, which may not be the best type of thing. Other drugs that have been used have been selegiline, which is a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. Um, Selegiline so actually gets metabolized to amphetamines. So one of the things that you will see is a person on selegiline may test positive for amphetamines with a drug test. Um, we prefer to try to use a sustained release of drug in the morning and then maybe at noon, but not to use this in the late afternoon or prior to driving. Um, with regard to, uh, again, because of um, the um, uh, it can interfere with the sleep architecture and also can sometimes make people sleepy. The cataplexy associated, we see a lot of drugs that have been tried. Uh, many of them are not FDA approved, but and we've seen some slow dose um, selegiline. But one drug which is sort of unusual, uh, and when I say unusual, it tends to show up in um, at, at times that's going to be where you may get asked questions on this, put it that way is sodium oxybate, which is a derivative of GHB. Um, this is FDA approved. Uh, there's only one, the active ingredient is actually gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is GHB. Uh, one pharmacy sells it, which is in, I think it's in Lu uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you take uh, one dose at bedtime and the second one two and a half to four hours later. And uh, that's been used for cataplexy, but it is highly controlled. The DEA fought very strongly about um, it being even approved, but it is a derivative of GHB because it gets <clears throat> metabolized to GHB. Um, condition we talked about earlier <clears throat> is restless leg syndrome. The idea is let's uh, use drugs to sort of suppress the abnormal sensations so that your legs aren't kicking around and moving. And if they're not moving, then it helps you consolidate your sleep and sleep well. So again, this is a movement disorder. So what we've seen used are the mainstay of therapy or dopamine agonist. And that seems to affect that dopamine pathway in the basal ganglia. Um, people have used like benzodiazepines and sedative hypnotics, which sort of just sedate you. But the preference is to use the dopamine agonist uh, to try to interfere with that basal ganglia uh, loop up there. Uh, a lot of drugs, most of these are dopamine agonists, which are the preferred tree. Probably the one that um, Repinarol was uh, probably one of the first one that comes up, but here's several. Again, not necessarily that you know the doses or anything. We have seen gabapentin has been successful. We've seen um, the benzos. These are all benzodiazepines um, or hypnotics here. And then even we've seen some opiates being used, but we prefer not the opiates. We prefer probably um, the preferred treatment of choice is going to be the dopamine agonist. And then the parasomnias, these are things which usually don't require treatment. Um, if occasionally we may use a low dose of clonazepam, and what that do, what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of time in stage three and four. Most of the parasomnias occur there. Um, other thing that's been used is melatonin. 
um, three to 12 milligrams that can be purchased over the counter. Um, um, obstructive airway disease, um, typically we're using CPAP and telling people to lose weight. There's oral devices, surgical therapy has been done. But one of the things that happens with obstructive airway is sometimes they will use provigil to the pe people are not being, uh, they're having difficulty. So they're being treated with continuous positive airway pressure. Um, sometimes we use the provigil to help them get through their uh, day because until they sort of get uh, going with that. Uh, a lot of people argue whether that should be done and to try to address the CPAP, but even with that, people still have difficulty staying awake during the day. So, and yeah, the Stanford surgical process used to be used quite a bit, Carmen. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have with regard to this. I am going to send you guys, as I said, a few articles for your edification. I'm not gonna test you on those articles, but I will send those and get those out. I will have the test available, sent to Aiden no later than Tuesday. Uh, my goal is to try to have it sent um, by um, tomorrow. And um, the only thing we've got left to do is basically um, you guys have a test to take, uh, three questions, and um, Aiden has got those, and Aiden will post the, uh, the answers on Moodle um, a little bit later on, either later today or tomorrow. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, the next time I see you, we will be talking about uh, treatment of schizophrenia. And we will, we will have some case studies with regard to that. And uh, at least one, maybe two case studies incorporated into it um, with uh, this week with a couple of things coming up with the thing with meeting with Judy and stuff like that. It was just a little difficult to put that in. Plus, I know you guys have had a pretty stressful week uh, with all the stuff coming in with the schedule. Any of the material that you have questions on, do not hesitate to email me. Uh, does anybody have any question other than that? If not, I will turn it over to Aiden for him to post the test. And uh, I hope you guys have a great uh, rest of the day and uh, have a great week. So with that, I will bid you farewell. And it, uh, I will tell you, it's been a joy being back with you guys again. You guys have, um, you guys have been a favorite class of mine. And um, I will send Danielle with regard to, I'll, I got to check the new schedule and see what the thing is, but we will send it. But if anything, it'll be something just where you get need to log in a Moodle and ask, uh, answer questions. So we'll send that to you as quick as possible. So you guys have a great day. Aiden, thank you so much. And I'll be sending you some stuff either later tonight or first thing in the morning. Thank you, doctor. I'll keep the poll on for another 10 minutes. Okay. Thanks, Aiden. You have a great day. Thank you. Too.